Now that we got the Planet Hulk characters out of the way, let's look at the comic backstories behind the three other characters being introduced in the January season of Marvel Snap. But first, if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to this channel, and more importantly, share this. This isn't the kind of video that I usually make, so if you're in different you know, communities to play Marvel Snap, it'd be really helpful to put this video out there so that more people can kind of see these, because I do think Marvel Snap fans are gonna get a lot out of this, as well as just general Marvel fans who aren't super familiar with some of these characters. Maybe you've read a comic or two where they've shown up, maybe you've seen them in movies or TV shows and you've never really quite understood them, we're going to talk about it. And I'm excited because I really enjoy these three specific characters. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I like Kyra, I like Meek, Scar is fine, but these guys are old school Marvel characters who have gone through lots of different arcs and changes, have a lot of different personality, have developed lots of different fan bases, so it's fun to talk about them. And let's start with one of my absolute favorites, Hercules. Hercules first appeared in Journey into Mystery Annual Number 1 in 1965. He was written by Stan Lee and drawn by Jack Kirby. Basically, he's the Hercules you kind of think he is. Not exactly the Hercules from the Disney movie, a slightly more adult Hercules. One that was designed to be an enemy and then ally and foil to Thor. So he's very similar to Thor in a lot of those ways. He's very headstrong, like punch first, ask questions later kind of god. He's got a signature weapon. It's that gold adamantine mace, which According to Wikipedia, it doesn't have a name. I've never seen it named. It probably has a name. There was a series that came out not too long ago called Herc, where he had to sacrifice all of his power to save everybody. And in that, he supplemented the fact that he didn't have superpowers anymore by getting really into these weapons and different trinkets that he picked up along the way. And in those fights, it would highlight what thing he was using. So, you know, you figure you have to have gone through the mace at one point. Whatever it is, Macy, Macy only, or he's got a mace. Originally, he shows up to fight Thor, although his first appearance wasn't actually him. But, like, eventually, he meets Thor, fights Thor pretty quickly. As they say in the Weekly Planet, they punched up a bit, and then they were mates. And, like, Hercules and Thor are very similar in terms of power. Hercules is more of a brawler. He doesn't have the electricity powers and the storm powers that Thor tends to have, but he's a very skilled fighter. He's got a lot of superhuman durability and strength and stuff like that. Here's my best way to describe Hercules personality-wise. In the comics, Thor is pretty similar to how he is portrayed in Thor's 1, 2, and Avengers 1. Thor in Ragnarok and Love and Thunder is a little closer to what Hercules is like. He's kind of a jock. He's not incredibly bright. He gets into trouble, he starts fights, he's got an ego, he likes to drink, he likes to have fun. He's a very entertaining character, but he's not quite as serious as Thor. Now, obviously, he's gone through a lot of different character arcs and he's done a lot of different things, but I would say Thor is a generally more well-adjusted, developed version of Hercules. Like, there's a lot of things that are different about these two characters. In the mythology that Hercules originally came from, that the comic is based on, he is not the legitimate heir to Zeus's throne. He is Zeus's son with a human woman. So where Thor is more the actual heir to Asgard, Hercules is not quite the heir to Olympus. And that sometimes is, I think, a sticking point for this character. He wants to prove himself, kind of like Hercules does in the cartoon movie, the Disney movie. He's good friends with Thor. He's good friends with Hulk. He's been an Avenger. He's joined a couple of different teams. I believe he was on the Champions for a while. He's mostly known recently for working with Amadeus Cho as a big part of the Chaos War storyline that I talked about in my Thor 5 pitch. But the thing that I love the most about Hercules, the thing that I find the most entertaining, about him besides his design which I think his design is fantastic it's a very interesting like strange iconic comic book design that has not really changed right like look at the difference between Thor when he you know first appeared and Thor today versus Hercules when he first appeared and Hercules today very similar but the most fun thing about Hercules is just his vibe He's a fun guy. I believe he's the character who got Wonder Man involved with Hollywood when Wonder Man decided he wanted to be an actor, he didn't want to be an Avenger anymore. I think Hercules was like, oh yeah, I know some of those guys, I'll introduce you. He loves to drink, he loves to go out, have fun. He also has that Thor language, not quite the same way, but that like a vasty monster, you know, that kind of stuff, which is always fun to see in a setting that's not like high Olympian fantasy. But my favorite thing about Hercules, and I don't know the best, most respectful way to say this, he sleeps around a lot. It's very fun. So for example, because I had never read the story Herc before, which is the depowered Hercules story. In that story, he goes and fights some guys on the subway. And in the first issue, he doesn't have any money or powers anymore. So he's to get a job. He finds a Greek restaurant that I believe is renting a room. 
and becomes part of that family. Now, one member of this family is a woman in her 20s or something, and immediately Hercules sleeps with her. And like, I think the fun thing about Hercules, it's not just like, it's funny that he's sleeping with everybody, but he really just, a lot of these characters, and this is something that's very sure in the movies, like Iron Man in the comics, or Hawkeye in the comics, has lots of weird flings, and the stories kind of become soap operas, where like this one, you know, you used to, Hawkeye used to be married to Mockingbird, and now he's dating whoever. Now, I think this in the movies for, the reasons you would expect has gotten kind of toned down, right? Iron Man, you know, maybe flirted a little bit with Black Widow and Iron Man 2, but for the most part, like, he's a one-woman man. Hawkeye traditionally constantly flirting with women, marrying them, getting in trouble, does not do that in the movies at all. Now, I'm not saying I want every superhero in all these movies and comics to just be them, you know, hooking up with different superheroes, but I do think it's fun. It's something I really liked about the She-Hulk show, something that I think Daredevil sometimes does right in the show. He's had a couple of different girlfriends, or, like, he doesn't have his one true pairing where he needs to be with Karen Page. It's a little bit more fluid, especially going into season four. But I do think a lot of the time when you talk about, oh, this is a more adult show, this is a very adult Marvel show. What does that mean? It means violence and gore and sometimes like nudity and maybe some sex, which is fine. But I think part of what makes these stories appealing to adults is if it feels like a story about adults. And one thing that some adults do is just hook up with people. You know, everybody knows some people that are like that and some people that aren't, both are fine. But I do think that first group is very underrepresented in the movies for sure and in comics a little bit. Though it is funny that Hercules will just immediately you throw him into a book with some, you know, super powered woman or man and he will probably try to get down. Like he's, it's no question. He is, I would say next to maybe Daredevil, who I think is also kind of known for this. Although Daredevil's more known for it in this like, oh my God, Matt has another, you know, girlfriend that's gonna get killed or something. Like what a, what a disaster he is. Either way, it's fun. It is fun that he is that guy, right? Cause the Avengers aren't all that, but he's that one friend who they have who's going to go out to a bar and they're going to drink and they're going to, you know, dance and have a lot of fun and they're probably going to go home with someone and you're like, ah, that's Hercules, you know? I like that he serves that role in the Avengers and in Marvel Comics generally. I know I really like focus on that. I think there's a lot of good things about Hercules. Let's don't get me wrong. There's other stories he's been in and he has a character that's existed since the 60s. So like he's pretty much done it all. But I do think looking back and looking forward is like, What purpose does this character serve? What what do you think about when you think about Hercules? It's that. He's the character that sleeps around all over the Marvel Universe in a way that is, you know, kind of silly. And I don't know, it's kind of lovable. I like that about Hercules. So in Marvel Snap, Hercules is a four cost, seven power, and his ability is the first time another card moves here each turn, move it to another location. I don't know specifically why they went with this power for Hercules. It's kind of a bummer because it's not a particularly effective power. I don't think move decks in general are very in, or at least they're they're an archetype that can be very fun to play, but if you want to win, they're not usually, even when they've been at their best, they're still usually beatable by, you know, a couple of other pretty consistent decks. But also, like, you kind of figure, okay, well, are there some move cards that Hercules kind of knows that are his friends where it's like, oh, yeah, he spent so much time with Iron Fist. Of course, that's why he's in this move. The answer is, I don't really think so. I guess there's two consistencies with move. One is a lot of the spider characters move. Spider villains and heroes both either move cards, move themselves, or benefit from being moved or hurt other characters who are moving. That happens all over the game. It's one of the like character archetypes I find quite fun. The other one is Magneto and Polaris both pull cards to them. I think it's probably other cards that do that, but like those two magnetic cards have that power. But besides that, there's no like he's not related to Human Torch in any really interesting way. His power is not useful with Thor or any of the other Asgardians. There is no Amadeus Cho card, so he can't work with him. So honestly, I don't know where they got this one. Besides just maybe Hercules is like, hey, if you come over here, I'm gonna punch you and I'm gonna knock you out of there. You know, like if Hercules is somewhere and you try to get in his turf, he'll push you out of the way. I think that maybe that's it. I mean, maybe it's the it's the it's the one night stand situation. I don't think that's what they went for. So. 
is this really reflective of any superpower Hercules has? Not really. I guess he's like really strong so he can move characters, but I don't know. I don't think it's like what he's known for. On the other side, do I think this ability feels like a Hercules ability? Yeah, I do. I don't know what it is, but there's something about like your card moves into Hercules, Hercules goes, hey, and then your card goes into another space. That feels kind of Hercules-y. It's kind of chaotic, which is his general vibe. Uh, overall, I don't think this is incredible, you know, adaptation. I also don't think as it is right now, it's an incredibly useful card, but I don't think it fully doesn't work with Hercules. I don't know. And you may recognize Hercules, but says from comics, he shows up in the end of Thor Love and Thunder, played by Brett Goldstein from Ted Lasso. He is one of those cameos, we get them a lot now, where at the end of the movie, uh, an actor you recognize shows up in a costume that comic fans would recognize and poses in that costume and we may never see them again. That seems like how these are how these are being handled between him, Clea, Star Fox, like it's just it's just what they do. Moving right along, let's talk about the next card that was introduced this season that we haven't talked about yet, the Grandmaster. His real name, which I did not know before we started doing this, is Endwigast. All of the elders of the universe have a first name. I can't remember. The collector's name is something like Travel Terrine or something like that. They say it in the Thor 2 post credit scene, but he's he has a name. The Grandmaster is one of the elders of the universe. What that means is he is a character as old as creation itself, as old as the Big Bang. However, there's different kind of tiers of guys like that in Marvel Comics. So there's the one above all, who is God, who is the writer. Then there's guys like the Beyonder, who's the character that was in charge of the original Secret Wars event. And he is just one of an entire race of Beyonders that come up in the Infinity event, which we will talk about next video. And then underneath them, there are what you would call the cosmic entities. So these are your living tribunals, right? He's the cosmic entity of justice and balance in the universe. There's infinity, eternity, death. Galactus shows up in this tier. The Celestials are kind of around here, although sometimes they're like a step lower than all of these guys. So these are all super powerful characters, right? Like your top tier, the strongest characters in the Marvel Universe. Most of them just exist to facilitate these big existential storylines where a character has to kill death or something. So far below most of those guys, but still powerful are the elders of the universe. Now, obviously, these cosmic entities are these big amorphous constructs where you can't even fully perceive them, right? Like Galactus looks kind of like you because that's just what your brain puts on Galactus's face, where like if a scroll looks at like Galactus, Galactus looks like a scroll. Also, Galactus looks like he's 30 feet tall or something like that, but he's really like way bigger than that. The elders in the universe are closer to just kind of guys. Like they're like those characters in that they do represent specific concepts. They have been alive since the creation of the universe and they are powerful. They have like obviously extra longevity and some of them have extra strength and speed and all that, but they're not at the same level of characters like the Living Tribunal or Death or Galactus. I would say they're closer to what a character like Thanos is usually classified as. For instance, in a She-Hulk comic, She-Hulk fought one of these guys who's called the Champion. His whole thing is he wants to win all the fights, so he challenges people and then fights them. He was fighting with the Power Stone, so when he had to take that away, it was just him versus She-Hulk. Like, She-Hulk was able to beat him. It was tough, but like, you can beat these guys. We've seen two of them in the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies so far. First of all, obviously the Collector shows up in the Thor 2 post credit scene and then Guardians of the Galaxy 1. And then, first appearing in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, in the very, very end of the credits, you see the Grandmaster. This is a character played by Dr. Ian Malcolm himself, Jeff Goldblum. One of my favorite performances in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, so favorite that I have his action figure right here, see? Look at that guy, mm, yes, he's very, very handsome. He's got this great melting stick you can use to melt you, so there's that. I don't believe this is canon, but there is a picture in one of the Guardians of the Galaxy rides of the Grandmaster playing chess against the Collector, and I believe the Collector gets angry and like smacks the board off. And so that's the relationship these guys have. They're kind of like brothers and sisters, even though I don't think they're related, but they kind of think of themselves as one big group. So here are some of the ones that matter. We've got the Challenger, he plays lots of games, usually against the Grandmaster. You have the champion of the universe. He wants to fight everyone. You have the collector. He wants to get everything. You have the gardener who seeds life throughout the universe. You got guys like the runner who likes to explore everywhere. The trader who likes to negotiate. The character Voyager, who was introduced recently, apparently is one of these. I didn't realize that. That's interesting. But then right in the middle, you've got the Grandmaster. I would say he's maybe the most significant 
Elder of the Universe, next to the Collector, who's been very important since his appearances in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. But the Grandmaster A, I think, is probably, I don't I'm going to say he's had more appearances than the other ones. I don't know if that's true. But he shows up in a lot of big, important stories, does almost the same thing in all of them. But I don't know. There's just like a type of story that exists that is a Grandmaster story that you'll find, you know, again and again in comics. For example, this Avengers vs. the Justice League of America story. This is a classic, by classic, I mean, like, I think it was made in 2004. But, like, you know, these do not happen very often. There's this big conflict between Krona, a character from DC, and the Grandmaster from Marvel who wanted to see whose guys were best. So they created this game. That's what the Grandmaster always does. He creates some sort of game where he picks his team of guys and you pick your team of guys and they fight. And then whoever wins gets something. In his first outing in Avengers 69, I believe, 69, 70, and 71, he has a fight with Kang where Kang wants to heal Ravonna Renslayer. So the Grandmaster's like, all right, well, I'm going to make a team of champions and you'll have them fight whoever you pick. So Kang picks the Avengers and the Grandmaster picks a team of characters that I don't think existed up until this point. The Squadron Sinister, as they were known then, eventually the Squadron Supreme, which are the Justice League pastiches in Marvel Comics, Hyperion, Power Princess, Nighthawk, all those guys. He really does just show up and go like, ooh, I got an idea, I got a thing I want to do, isn't this going to be fun? And everybody goes, ugh, no, this is going to be bad, but they have to compete because he does have powers and sometimes he kidnaps somebody that's important or whatever, like somebody's life hangs in the balance. Honestly, like... Based on what the original Secret Wars event was, where it was all the heroes and all the villains getting brought to a specific planet, it was a patchwork created from different parts of the universe, and being forced to fight each other, like to prove something about good and evil, like that's exactly what the Grandmaster would be doing. He's got blue skin and white hair, they didn't do that in Thor, but they gave him like the blue strip of makeup and they gave him like a interesting color of hair that kind of dyed his hair extra gray. And yeah, he's one of the more conniving, sneaky elders of the universe. And like I said, his first appearance was in Avengers 69 in 1969. Okay. And the Grandmaster was created by Roy Thomas and Sal Buscema. But he's a fun character, serves a very specific purpose. He's honestly like a kid playing with their action figure. Or he's your friend who's betting on five football games every Sunday. But like what he is for is taking characters that may not fight in a normal context and having them fight for fun, right? Of his first appearance. And obviously this story, Avengers vs. Justice League, is like that was the whole purpose of it, which is give them a reason to fight. Okay, that's the Grandmaster's job. In Marvel Snap, he's a two cost, zero power, and he is an on reveal card. It says move one of your other on reveal cards here to the middle location. Its ability happens again. So I realize the wording to that might be a little confusing. The way I'm reading it is you put the Grandmaster on one of your three spaces. I don't know if it works on the center space. It probably doesn't because you can't move from the center to the center. But let's say you put him on the right space. There's already an Iron Heart there, let's say. So Iron Heart is user power added two to three different cards. You're going to put the Grandmaster on that space. Ironheart or one of the other unreveal cards, but like let's say she's the only one that's there now. So Ironheart is going to be moved to the center space and then her ability is going to activate again. I think this is a card with a lot of utility. There's a lot of usefulness here. I don't know what it is. He's kind of a complicated card. I'm going to see how people play him and what the different decks end up being. Like obviously you can do pretty good stuff in a negative deck because he is a zero power but obviously you can see him working well with characters like Thor Black Panther who has an on reveal ability that powers them up obviously Thor doesn't have that Mjolnir has it but you know what I mean so what do I think of the actual translation of the Grandmaster's powers and what he's all about onto the Marvel snap card I think this is very good because he is like taking a card putting them in the center like in the you know ring where he has his characters fight and then making them fight, like making them activate their ability again. So like, yeah, that's that's a great, great Grandmaster card. Makes complete sense. And why is Grandmaster in the Planet Hulk card group? Well, it's obvious he takes the place of the Red King from the Planet Hulk comic as the guy in charge of Sakaar making people fight. They decided for the Thor Ragnarok movie to use the Grandmaster instead. He also like appears very briefly, I think, in the Planet Hulk animated movie. But I think it's just like a cameo because the Red King is still there. All right, last one. The big boy, Beta Ray Bill. He is plenty of people's favorite Marvel character. And I think 
if you read the right stories and if Thor stories and you know stories like this are your kind of thing, it's easy to see why. He is like Thor, but kind of different in ways that are cool. Like he's he's a tougher Thor. He's a more serious Thor. He's got a different design that's a little bit more fun. Maybe I don't know. Depends on what you think of Big Orange Horsemen. But the basic story behind Bill, he was created in 1983 in Mighty Thor number 337 by Walt Simonson. His whole deal is Searcher came and destroyed his planet, the planet of Corbin, and his people who were able to survive needed a champion, someone to protect them. So they did all these science experiments and turned one of their own, Bill, into their protector. He was at that time just a big jacked horse guy, but he runs into Thor and like I said, Weekly Planet, they punched up a bit and then they were mates. But very importantly, in the fight, Beta Ray Bill was able to pick up Mjolnir. He was worthy. I believe he is the first non-Asgardian to wield Mjolnir. And one of a very few still, like it's a the groups expanded a lot, but still it's a pretty small circle. And he's the first one to do it that wasn't also an Asgardian. So after Bill picks up the hammer, Thor's like, oh never mind, this guy's cool. The hammer wouldn't lie. And eventually Odin gave Beta Ray Bill his own hammer. It was a gold hammer with the axe head on one side, and it's called Stormbreaker. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Stormbreaker is the name of the hammer that is created in Infinity War, but in these stories, in the comics, it is the hammer created specifically for Beta Ray Bill. And it's the same as Mjolnir. It's the same size. It's not like a big two-handed axe. It's another kind of one-handed, you know, hammer, whatever, whatever these are. Hammer, weapon, bludgeoning thing. Stormbreaker also gives him the power of Thor. He could do big electricity blasts because he's worthy. So he becomes Beta Ray Bill and then he protects the Corbinites, travels the universe, he is a friend of Thor's, he fights characters like Galactus who tries to kill his Corbinites when they find their next planet, New Corbin. He fights Surtur again. He's an ally of Thor's. He's great. I would say out of all of these books, because I'm going to say, for Hercules, I, I like, I've read a lot of books with Hercules in them, right? He was an Avenger for a while. He'll show up in, like I said, a She-Hulk book. But I would recommend, I guess, Herc or the Chaos King story, which he is a pretty big part of. For the Grandmaster, I'd say read Justice League vs. Avengers, because that's just a great story, and it's, it's pretty short. Or you can read the story in Avengers 69, 70, and 71. For Beta Ray Bill, either you read his original story from the 80s, or... You read the new comic by Daniel Warren Johnson. This thing is so good. Daniel Warren Johnson is the hotness right now, and he he deserves it. Everything he's been doing, do a power bomb. The Transformers book has been so good. Beta Ray Bill series, I believe is five issues, maybe six, came out a couple of years ago. And it's just Beta Ray Bill going to hell to kill Surtur. That's the whole story. He needs to get a special sword to do it, and he just, you know gets some allies that can help him do that and then goes to do it but the art like this thing looks so extreme it looks like it should be painted on the side of a van here's some images from this series it's it's awesome it's one of my favorite recent series i recommend it to everybody that also shows you kind of beta ray bill's deal takes himself very seriously he's very tough he has like a relationship with sif the asgardian warrior but it's difficult because he is a big Corbinite guy, especially in this book, he can't transform back because he doesn't have Stormbreaker. I'd say maybe one of the main things people like about Beta Ray Bill, Thor waffles between being kind of a sillier character and a very serious heroic character. If you're only in it for the serious heroic kind of Thor, you just do Beta Ray Bill. Obviously there aren't as many Beta Ray Bill stories as there are you know, Thor stories, but Beta Ray Bill is a really, really fun character. It's a great design. I mean, Walt Simonson did so many amazing things for Thor, and Beta Ray Bill is one of his best creations. So what is Beta Ray Bill doing Marvel Snap? He is a four cost, six power, and his on reveal ability you shuffle Stormbreaker into your deck. What is Stormbreaker it is a zero cost one power card with an on reveal ability of double Beta Ray Bill's power. So he's a four six, so if you're able to play Stormbreaker, he has, becomes a 412, which is good. So he works the same way as Thor. There is a item, a token, or whatever you want to call it, another card that when you activate Thor, gets put into the deck, and then you have to draw that and then play it, and you power up your Thor. So in this case, a 46 can turn into a 412 if you're able to play Stormbreaker once. But that's the fun thing about cards like this. You can sometimes activate their power twice, so you can get two Stormbreakers. Or you can figure out a way to activate Stormbreaker twice. So there's two big differences between Beta Ray Bill and Thor. We're able to play Thor earlier because he's a three cost, which means it, you have more turns to draw Mjolnir than you would to draw Stormbreaker, assuming that he goes out on turn four like you would expect. The bigger difference, though, the one that makes Beta Ray Bill 
seem fun and like makes him a better Thor is if you are adding power by just adding, you know, you add six and then another six and another six, like you will raise the power of your Thor if you're able to do it like two or three times. That would be pretty substantial. You'll be in the 20 power range, whatever. If you're able to use Mjolnir three times, starts at six, double to 12, double to 24, double to a 48 power. So he's a much higher ceiling and it doesn't take a whole lot of work to get him to at least 24 power. Do I think this is a good translation of Beta Ray Bill? Honestly, I kind of don't. Like in my head, the way a Beta Ray Bill card would work is you would just take whatever the Thor card is and do it again. You would put another Thor into your deck because Beta Ray Bill and Thor essentially have the same power. Beta Ray Bill is not a better Thor. And he's not really that different either. It's not like Stormbreaker has different powers. I mean, I'm sure it has some different powers, but it's not like kind of like She-Hulk and Hulk where it's like, well, this one's obviously the really strong one and this one's the smart one or whatever. Not that Hulk isn't smart. Hulk's smart all the time. But it, you, you kind of see what I mean. Like, hypothetically, if these two characters fought, they should fight to a stalemate. But I think Beta Ray Pill, because he has this multiplying, he has just a higher ceiling. So he's better than Thor. But if I was in charge, if I were just making this card based on exactly what Beta Ray Pill does in the comics, I would just make it another Thor. I would make it the same stats as Thor. He has a Stormbreaker instead of a Mjolnir, so he can't use the one hammer to power. Oh no, you know what? You should be able to use the one hammer to power both of them because they can use them interchangeably. So yeah, I think what I would want to do is I would want him to work with Mjolnir as well. And maybe Stormbreaker would be a variant for Mjolnir in the case like if you're playing with Beta Ray Bill. But like hypothetically, Stormbreaker and Mjolnir should both be able to power up both Thor and Beta Ray Bill because they can use the hammers interchangeably. But I understand why they went with what they went with. And I think as far as the translation from the page to the card, I think the Beta Ray Bill card is fine. I do think like this deck is going to be good. I like Thor, Jane, Odin combos. So just throwing another guy in there, like a three cost, a four cost, then a five cost, then a six cost. You can play them all in a row. You could get a lot out of those cards. Like, and then you throw in Lockjaw and other decks that empower Thor, Wong. Yeah, I think these, uh, you know, Beta Ray Bill should be a fun card. I'm, I'm pretty excited for him. I think I am going to get him in Spotlight Caches, but I also don't have Galactus yet. And I like that also Bloodstone variant. So it's a win, win, win. And yeah, if you take nothing else from this video, read. The Daniel Warren Johnson Beta Ray Bill comic, it is so good. Also, Beta Ray Bill, why is he part of this grouping? Because Planet Hulk is not a story he is traditionally a part of. Well, A, in Thor Ragnarok, you see a Corbinite head. It's just, you're assuming it's Bill on the Grandmaster's Tower, so you're supposed to be like, oh, he's been here before, which wouldn't make any sense because Thor would have met him, but whatever. But B, more importantly, in the Planet Hulk movie, Instead of using Silver Surfer as the character that they have to fight that eventually frees all the gladiators, including Hulk, they use Beta Ray Bill in the cartoon. I don't know why. It serves pretty much the same purpose. I'm not sure if that cartoon is supposed to line up with Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Like, maybe it was that. Because they were like, oh, we already have Beta Ray Bill in this universe and we don't have a Silver Surfer yet. Maybe. I'm not really sure why they did that. But Beta Ray Bill shows up in the animated Planet Hulk movie, so that's probably why he's here. So that's the six of them. So between this video and the last video, we got all six. Scar, Kyra, Hercules, Meek, Grandmaster, and Beta Ray Bill. So again, share this video. Thank you so much for watching. Next video is going to come out in February. We're going to be talking about the characters in the story called Infinity by Jonathan Hickman. that introduced Black Order and specifically Black Swan, a character that outside of that I had never heard of before. So that's something that I had to like really look up. And I think some of the way that those cards work is they've been data mined so far. What it seems like they're going to be able to do is interesting. And I think the way it's connected to some of the comic stories they're from is interesting. That's all I'll say. It's a great, like I'd say if you've got time and you just want to like read something else. And obviously you read Daniel Warren Johnson's Beta Ray Bill. I recommend this story. So every issue of Infinity, because this is Jonathan Hickman and nothing can be simple, has this chart that tells you which issues of infinity you have to read which issues of avengers you have to read and which issues of new avengers you have to read in what order so like 
you know, be prepared. It's a bunch of books and you gotta kind of get a switch between them, but it's a very good story. And it leads into the second Secret Wars, which is also written by Jonathan Hickman. But, so yeah, next month we're talking about Black Order characters uh, created by Jonathan Hickman, uh, Jim Chung, Mark Morales, Justin Ponser, and Chris Eliopoulos.